Good morning. Let's start by singing number 48. Number 48. See number 48. Anywhere with Jesus. Anywhere with Jesus I can safely go. Anywhere he leads me in this world below. Anywhere without him dearest joys would fade. Anywhere with Jesus I am not afraid. Anywhere, anywhere fear I cannot know. Anywhere with Jesus I can safely go. Anywhere with Jesus I am not alone. Other friends may fail me, he is still my own. Though his hand may lead me over dearest ways. Anywhere with Jesus is a house of praise. Anywhere, anywhere, fear I cannot know. Anywhere with Jesus I can safely go. Anywhere with Jesus over land and sea. Telling souls in darkness of salvation free. Ready as he summons me to go or stay. Anywhere with Jesus when he points the way. Anywhere, anywhere, fear I cannot know. Anywhere with Jesus I can safely go. Anywhere with Jesus I can go to sleep. When the darkening shadows round about me creep. Knowing I shall wake and never more to roam. Anywhere with Jesus will be home, sweet home. Anywhere, anywhere, fear I cannot know. Anywhere with Jesus I can safely go. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we are so grateful for you and your son and, and that you give us guidance and, and have, have given us direction and have provided so many wonderful blessings for us and we do truly pray that we will feel comfortable going anywhere you lead anywhere that your son tells us to go we pray that we will take those words to heart and take jesus with us as we go into this life and we just pray that we can get encouragement this morning from bible class and worship so that we're prepared to go back into the world and shine our light in it and just just show the world the importance of following you and being your servant so we just pray for continued guidance in doing all the work of the church you've given us, and we pray for success as we do so. We do pray for those who are sick and hurting. We pray for those who are traveling away from us this week, and we just pray that, that we'll be able to return together, that we will be able to come back together in praise and, and, and fellowship and working for you. We just pray for safety and healing in, in every situation that, that we know of and you know of that, that needs that at this time. And we just pray that we can have the encouragement again to, to be following your will in our lives. And it's in Jesus' name we say this prayer. Amen. Well, as we start Bible class, all I can do is kind of say, uh, anything interesting happened in the last couple of weeks? Um, <laughs> I will say, uh, pray for the, the camps. Uh, so we went to West Virginia Christian Youth Camp, and if you're not up to date, we... Uh, uh, had a COVID outbreak, uh, and several of us were going on to work other weeks of camp that, that got derailed, obviously, and we have heard from the second week of camp at West Virginia Christian Youth Camp, they have had a few cases of COVID themselves, and uh, they're supposed to have another week of camp up there this week. Um, now, yeah, I, I don't know if y'all care or not, but I'll tell you anyways, they are disinfecting the entire camp in between weeks now. Uh, we cause that, uh, <laughs> and uh, making sure that they're, they can, can go forward the best that they can. Uh, but uh, uh, as far as Surprise Valley goes, uh, uh, basically as far as I've heard, they've avoided it. Uh, eight of us were supposed to go from West Virginia Christian Youth Camp Senior Week to work Surprise Valley Senior Week. And uh, four, oh, 11, so at least four or five or six of us uh, all dropped out of that at the last second, which means Chris Roberts had a fun time uh, putting together a week of camp. But some people stepped up and stepped in for us, and uh, they, they were able to have a successful week of camp, and we were glad to hear that. 
So just pray that these camps can continue going forward and continue having success. I'll tell you more about that later. Uh, but um, we're starting a new Bible class. I know it's the uh, third week of July. Uh, so usually we would start a whole new subject the first week of July, uh, which I'm usually out of town. So I was going to start at the second week of July. And we are very blessed to have uh, willing and able teachers to fill in at the last second uh, when things go a little sideways. And we're thankful Todd was was filling in for us the last couple of Sunday mornings. Uh, so so did an excellent job, Todd. So thank you for doing that. Um, but uh, uh, I wanted to introduce the subject last week. We're, we're now down to maybe studying this for uh, 11 weeks. And uh, we'll see how far we get into this subject. But it's a it's a new subject. Uh, uh, except it's a, it's a very important subject. It's the subject of life. All right? Now, as I say that in Sunday morning Bible class, when I say the word life, what do you think we're going to talk about? All right, good, good. Blank slates. That's, this is going to be great. Well, your, your diagram would say death. <laughs> okay, the diagram up there says death. <laughs> let's start here we we do need to uh and, and let me see let's see i don't want to put it up there yet so so i did want to just start with a definition of of the word life and, and again what's your definition of life oh man this is gonna be great isn't it funny sometimes that some of the simplest concepts are really hard to define uh, I, I, I think that's not surprising because it's like we just all know what we mean when we say life, right? Right? I, except if you look up uh, – in uh, I, and I had to do this online. I didn't have access to my office this week for some reason. Uh, but I had to look it up online uh, on, on you know, I don't know, merriamwebster.com or something like that. Uh, and, and there's actually like 10 definitions of life. Uh, th there's actually a lot of explanation of this very simple concept of we, we just know what life is. And, and so what I did is I actually I, I picked the definition that most fits what we want to talk about uh, from Merriam-Webster. And I'm going to have to turn around and read it because uh, I didn't print off these notes. Uh, the quality that distinguishes a vital and functional being from a dead body, a principle or force that is considered to underlie the distinctive quality of animate beings. Y'all get it yet? <laughs> that's a simple way of saying it's something that's alive as opposed to dead and that's it are there different types of life they're, 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 yeah they're, there's one very simple way to define that uh, uh, it, are plants alive not in my house according to Katie you know outside where they're safe are, uh, pla is plant life and animal life the same? No, there's a, there's a difference about them. What is that difference? Well, okay, then we get to, well, I just know the difference. Our animals aren't green. Our animals aren't green. Well, some are. Uh, <laughs> lots of people got it there. <laughs> All right. How about, how about this? What about a rock versus grass? The rock's not alive, but the grass is. And, and yet, you know, so like, so, so is the quality of life mobility? Well, no. Yeah, yeah. You can make a rock mobile, and you can uh, and you can have plants that aren't. You know, so so it's 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 simple concepts, but yet hard to define uh, of what exactly we mean. But yet we still go. There is a quality of life that we understand. Things have plants, animals, and us. We understand that they have life. Now, is this a biblical subject? Well, obviously, hopefully, yes, or else you know, what am I doing up here? Uh, but uh, uh, before we get to that, 480 times in the New King James Version, the word life appears. Uh, that's just the word life, not living or, or live or alive. It's just the word life appears 480 times. And so over the next 11 weeks, we're going to look at all of them. Just kidding. Um, but, but we're going to look at several key scriptures. And what's funny is when I looked up the Greek word translated life, well, first of all, you got, what is it, eight Hebrew words that are translated to the English word life. 
and then you have five Greek words. Two of the Greek words actually are very interesting. One is, it would probably pronounce, be pronounced zoe or zoe, um, but if you were to transliterate it into English, it would spell Z-O-O. Ever, ever heard of that? Um, so, you know, the zoo, where we go look at other types of life, right? Uh, uh, and, and get to see that on display. Uh, or zoology, the study of animal life. That's where that all comes from. That comes from a Greek word, zoe or, or zo or something like that, because I'm, don't, I'm not good at the pronunciation of Greek. But, uh, uh, you know, that, that they're like, that's pointing to animated life uh, uh, that is, is, is animalistic. But then another Greek word for life that's translated life in our Bible is, uh, uh, well, bios. Like, yeah, biology, which is the study of life, uh, or, or biosphere, a, a, a sphere that holds life in it, you know. So, so you know, that they, these are, are, are modern words that we still apply to life come from some of these Greek roots that, that we can see used in biblical words. Um, What's funny is when you read through these definitions, and, and uh, you know whether you use online or have physical copies of uh, Vine's study of New Testament words, or uh, no, it'd be Vine's expository dictionary of New Testament words, or Wilson's uh, Old Testament word study. These are the two main main sources I use to define uh, Bible words. Uh, when you look at them, it really still kind of keeps boiling down to this concept of life is. It's something within us that just saying it animates us is, is not enough. It, it's, what, it, it's the essence of life within us. You know, it, and that's, again, it, it's, it's such a simple concept that becomes complicated to say, so what is that essence of life within us? You know, what, what makes an animal an animal, a plant a plant, and, and humans human? What makes us different and the same, because we all have a quality of life, but we're not necessarily equal right on the beginning. And so that's, that's kind of where we're just starting this, is trying to define life and see it as a biblical concept of something. Well, spoiler, we're going to start at the beginning of Genesis. Something God put in us. That's where life starts. It starts with what God put in us to make us this. All right. Go ahead, Todd. Oh, Ann was saying that, that at least one of the defining qualities of life, as we understand it, is that it has a beginning and an end. Yeah. Unless something happens to them, because water and rocks are consistent, except if you apply the water to the rock over enough time, the rock goes away. But that's been applied. Very true. And that's, that's, that's some of it, too, is, is, yeah, life is kind of defined by a, a beginning, a middle, and an end. You know, th thus our, our little diagram up there uh, for you to look at. Except, isn't there a form of life that isn't defined by beginning, middle, and end? Yes, but, but that life isn't something we truly understand. Right. Spiritual life. Something that's a much deeper concept of us all. And we're going to get there. We're going to get there because there again, just like we can say, okay, there's a difference between uh, plant, animal, and humanity. We can also say, well, there's a difference between uh, uh, our, our physical life and, and, and spiritual life. And, and, and so, yeah, there's a, lot, there's a lot to this simple concept of life. And I just wanted to look at it from scripture because what we're really kind of boiling down to is we want to talk about the value of life, which is um, a big discussion today. <laughs> and, and not in just one realm, in lots of realms. It's a big discussion, uh, uh, the value of life and, and what we need to go back to. Here's what we really need to do. Because now that, that I'm, I'm defining more of where this class is going to go, we need to get rid of our preconceived notions 
about the value of life and look what the Bible says about it. Because that's, that's the struggle. That's the struggle we're dealing with in the world at large is, is everybody's trying to apply humanity's value of life to X, Y, and Z instead of applying God's value of life to everything. You know, and, and, it, and it is a constant struggle in so many realms, and that's why I thought it would just be go, go back and just do a study of, so what do we mean by life? Now, I, I want to give a bad illustration of life, all right? And, th and then we'll get to the Bible, I promise you. <laughs> you know, so does a puppet have life? All right, you know, the, the, you know, the people who, who can throw their voices and make their, their hands talk. Does that, does that puppet they put over – you put life into it, didn't you? Because when you put your hand into the puppet, it's animated. It works. Some people can make it talk. See, even that simple concept is so hard to illustrate life because it's such a simple concept, it's complicated. Because the puppet's still just a puppet. It's still dead. And see, some people would almost have humanity be puppets. That we're, we're not in control of anything. We don't know anything. Something has just filled these physical bodies with life, and then nothing else matters. It, it, and so the, the, the question becomes is whatever is the origination of life, which there you get, another big discussion, right? Whatever the origination of life, once we define that, we again find the value of life in its origination. Which is why we are going to start by going back to Genesis, chapter 1. Where, where do we find creation told? Where, the story of creation is found where in the Bible? Genesis 1 and 2. All right? Uh, uh, never forget that, actually, the way I count it, I think the creation story is told three times in the first two chapters of the Bible. The first time is verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. There's one creation story. <laughs> now, that creation story is flushed out in verses 2 through uh, uh, 31, where it talks about the six days of creation. And, and what's interesting is uh, um, life really appears on, on earth in uh, – is it, is it day three where we have – well, lands on day, day, uh, day three – and then it's populated with grass and seeds and, and, and all sorts of things. Uh, and then even in verse 20, which I don't have outlined up there, it says, Let the waters abound with an abundance of living creatures. So it doesn't use the word life, but it uses the word living. So these are living creatures that are in the water and are going to be in the skies. And then you get to day five, and you have all the animals made, living creatures on the earth. But it says in verse 30, also to every beast of the earth and to every bird of the air and to everything that creeps on the earth in which there is life, I have given every green herb for food, and it was so. Once God creates man, humanity, both man and woman on day six, because Genesis 2 is telling us really – it's telling us what happened on separate days of creation, but then woman was made on day six – which means Adam named a whole bunch of animals on day, day six, you know, Rover and, and that dumb one over there that we now call Cat and, you know, uh, Wilbur. And, um, you know, so, you know, he names all the animals and uh, 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 then sees he – this is all on day six that he sees he doesn't have a, a, an equivalent. And that's when God puts him to sleep and makes an equivalent uh, out of his rib and out of dust, and he gives it all life. He says this is life, a a and so God is the one that creates it and defines it right at the beginning. This is life, and again, right from the beginning, forms of life. So sea creatures, air creatures, land creatures, mankind, and even though it's created on, on, on two days, we see kind of four separate I don't know where you call them, acts of creation, separations of creation, that you have these classes of creation. And, and what's funny is that you go know, the, the bios, biology, we do study these things differently. You know, biology has tried to link them all through common ancestors, but we understand that there's a difference between uh, a bird and a fish. 
And we understand there's a difference between uh, a, 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 a horse and us, all right? And, and now, have those definitions been blurred over the last half century? Yeah. You know, I, I remember save the whales, collect the whole set, right? Is that what it was? No, that's not what they were talking about. It was, it was save the whales. And what, what did we like to point out as Christians when that discussion of save the whales was going on through the late 80s and early 90s? Is it, anybody going to bring it up first? Or am I going to have to? There you go. We want to save the whales but kill human life. And it upset us. It should. <laughs> so then we get into this, this preconceived notion of we're comparing different types of life and trying to value them. But we got to make sure we bring God in that conversation. So we're not going to get into that yet. I'm just bringing it up because it's something we got to talk about later. But is that the only place where a discussion of life needs to occur? No. There's, there's lots of life we need to talk about and talk about how God would value it because God created it. Now God has defined it. It's these, these, these bipeds over here and these quadrupeds over here and these swimming things over here and these flying things up there. That's all life. Now we got to determine how we are to, to, to value and, and define that. So again, in Genesis 2 where we have the third uh, telling of the creation story to flush out more details that weren't given in chapter 1 verses 2 through 31 there in verse 7 we read and the lord god formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living being boy you talk about a term that really grabs your attention uh, uh is is the breath of life what was original humanity made out of dirt all right you were a golem <laughs> until god came along and did what breathe life into that golem and made it life all right and that's that's the that's the whole image here is is it was just a pile of dirt until god said nope you're not a pile of dirt anymore here's the breath of life that's going to animate you and make you a living being Verse 9, and out of the ground the Lord God made every tree grow that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was also in the midst of the garden and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. All right, here's your thought question for the week. What caused humanity, after being booted from the garden, to still live for so long? What caused that? Good, good dirt. <laughs> All right. All right, they needed more time to teach their descendants to do right. Uh, but according to Genesis 6, they didn't do a very good job of that. Breath of life is still in us today, but why do we not live 900 years and Methuselah did? We evolved. Kick him out of class. No. Things did change by evolution. You know, not, not big-time evolution, but small-time evolution. Yeah, things changed. You are correct. Right. There's not a definitive so, answer, so except for mine. No. <laughs> God put this source of life called the tree of life. And, and, and now how many times from your physical experience do you ask for a blessing from God and it's beyond what you've ever imagined? I asked God, hey, we need somewhere to move to so I can preach. And we found Pine Grove and it was beyond our imagination in such a good way. You know, and, and, and hopefully that's happened to you a few times in your life too, like it's happened to me. Because when God gives you a blessing, it's very rarely just confined to what you want it the tree of life is the source of life in the midst of the garden and he tells adam and eve eat from it eat freely from it this tree over here knowledge of good and evil stay away don't don't eat of it and and, and but this one you partake of it 
Is it possible, as Todd suggested, that that tree of life was so powerful that however many generations later, when Methuselah and Lamech were living, that the power of life was still so strong, it caused them to live those extremely long lives. Definitively, we can't say yes, because it might have been another reason. The, the world was purer until it became impure. There, there was other factors, definitely, I think, that, that could have added in. But I'm just saying, maybe this blessing of God of life at the source of this tree was so powerful that maybe it affected still Methuselah generations later. Uh, just a theory. Uh, that, 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 again, that was your thought question for the week. So, so good thinking, but I, let me throw that out there and mull it over, and you can prove me wrong later. Go ahead, Louis. <laughs> Right. Each generation got a little shorter, a little shorter, a little shorter. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The world changed. Science and, and, and philosophy, I'm going to use those two fields, agree that something huge happened that changed the world and, and changed life, changed the, the longevity of life. Uh, uh, and, and the argument is, is, what was it? Was it a, a meteorite hitting the world millions of years ago or was a, a flood that happened several thousand years ago? Either way, we agree. Something happened that caused life to change on this planet. Uh, and, and that's the thing. Is, is, you know, so, so maybe it's not the tree of life or the tree of life alone. Maybe it was just the, the creation was so pure back then you know, that, that it was different. Now, I will say this as far as, as life goes as longevity. It bottomed out in about the, the – I'm going to throw a round number out here. You might find a better number uh, if you do your own research. But like, I'm going to say the 1400s. About the 15th century, as we're, we're ending the uh, Middle Ages and getting into the Renaissance, the Middle Ages, life really bottomed out. Average lifespan was really low, and ever since then, it's actually been going back up. All right, we're getting to longer lifespans now. Why? Well, we're doing more to try to take care of our bodies, and we have more technology to make our, our, our lives longer. Uh, uh, you know, th th think about it. <laughs> Is I thought in the 90s, and I'm not trying to be insensitive, but I thought in the 90s cancer was a new invention, you know, because, because we, we became so much more aware of it, right? Well, was there cancer before? Sure. We just called it by different names or didn't know what it was or didn't have the technology to catch it, and that caused shorter lifespans. Now we've devoted a whole field of medicine to catching it earlier, faster, treating it, so, you know, that changes longevity. But that all gets back to we're trying to get to this source of life as, as defined, and then we're trying to what? Make it last. We're trying to see how long it can last because we want to live longer lives, hopefully in our cases, for serving God. Now, a long time ago, Andrew had his hand up. Do you still want to make a comment? All right, then we're going to move on to – I don't know if Todd or Katie was first. Katie? Yeah. That we're actually keeping old people longer. We're keeping new people alive longer and, and the mortality rate is even more so. Yeah. You, talk, you talk about value of life in, in, in the medical field. Um, the first person that suggested in the maternity ward they should wash their hands between patients was 
I don't know what the sorry, he, he was basically almost stripped of his medical license. Yeah, they put him in a mental health asylum for suggesting maybe you should wash your hands between patient A and patient B. Um, I, I mean, it was it was considered ridiculous to 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 try to work in a sterile medical environment. You know, can you imagine that? <laughs> I, I, read and heard, heard, heard things about that, and I'm just like going, what in the world? Like now we wash our hands to the point of actually it become detrimental. We wash our hands so much. And so that just shows, you know, it, this, this, this understanding of life, we have to change it over time once we come up with new, better, more information, and that applies from, because God said it was this way at the beginning, and then we started changing the definition through the years for better or for worse. We started saying this life, not this life, this life, not this life. And we started giving. But God said, I'm going to give you this pure source of life, the tree of life. And, and, and I'm going to let you have access to it. And we see early on that purity may have equaled longevity. Um, but there again, at the end of it, however you look at it, verse 7 and 9 of Genesis chapter 2 are just pointing out that the origination, the source of life is God, right? The source of life is God. Theos gave us bios. And so we see that source of life, and therefore we have to go back to him to say, okay, you tell us what life is. All right, so let's look a little more into that. Um, going to Genesis chapter 3, a lot of discussion of life in Genesis chapter 3 as the uh, first family is trying to figure out life. Uh, let's go to verse 14. So the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, you have cursed more than all cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. So this serpent, who is this serpent? Yeah, I, I love that, that I've been here now, what? Six years, and you guys know he has a trick question when he looks like that, doesn't he? Because <laughs> what am I going to ask next? Where in the Bible does it tell us the serpent is Satan? It doesn't. Not this serpent. A serpent is Satan in Revelation. Yeah. So, yes. Now, here's the thing. We can assume the father of lies giving this first lie to Eve. This is, this is more than likely a safe assumption to say it is Satan. But scripture never says that. That's not what this class is about. I just uh, having fun with you. Um, but, but here it is, this serpent. Look at what he's done when he introduces this lie and co convinces Eve of the lie. He's actually affected not only his life, but every, every life. You're going to be more cursed than the beast of the field, uh, more cursed than all the cattle. Does sin affect animal life? I didn't know I was going to ask this question, so I don't have the answer. Does sin affect animal life? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Up until this point in Genesis chapter 3, what is the God-ordained diet of life? Plants. We never read of animals becoming part of the diet until after the flood now does that mean they weren't allowed or didn't have e eat animals before i think they totally did we just don't know if it was god ordained or not because god spoke to the fathers and we don't have everything he said to the fathers all right that's obvious with cain and abel but that's another story right but you know cain and abel he he obviously gave directions on how to be worshipped but we don't have those directions so maybe he ordained some, maybe he didn't. We don't know. It's not until after the flood that we read he ordained. Animal life can now sustain human life. All right? All that comes back to this is, is when Satan presented that lie and the sin was committed by Adam and Eve, when that happened, well, it affected every form of life. Now, I'm not saying animals sin. I'm not saying plants sin. Insert cat joke here about the animal sin, by the way. Unless it's yeah, unless it's cauliflower. <laughs> they sin by existence. Um, no. <laughs> no. The, 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 the truth is, is we have no, no 
a way of, of saying that those types of lives sin be, because, because is there something different between that type of life and our type of life? You know I mean? Is something different between animal and, and, and plant life and human life? Is there something different between us? Yeah. What does it say in Genesis 126? There's a big phrase in, in there when God said uh, that he was going to create humanity. Let us make man in our image. After our likeness. After our likeness. He did not say that about anything else. Dogs are not made in the image of God. Daisies are not made in the image of God. Calls are definitely not made in the image of God. All right. So, so we see that there's something different because God gave us something different when he created humanity than he gave to anything else. All right. Now, another thought question is what is that? image of God, likeness of God that he's speaking of. Because what do we assume? We assume it means God is a biped spiritual being uh, that has a big long beard and is definitely European. Uh, right? Well, sounds like Charlton. And sounds like Charlton Heston. <laughs> Unless you watch the movie with Whippy Colbert. Never mind. Not going to bring that up. <laughs> All right. Is that what made in his image means? Now, we're, we are speaking from a place of ignorance when we say this. But the more I study it, the less I think so. I don't think we can define God by being a biped uh, with, with a long beard and a certain color skin and a certain voice. You know, if we want to find his voice, it's in here. <laughs> All right? But, but what I'm saying is... is Something makes us different from the animals, all right? So think, think about what that is without thinking about those physical limitations. Yes? Well, God is a spiritual being. Therefore, his image and his likeness would be spirit. There you go. Spirit in of itself. And I know, I know we, we don't want to think of, of our beloved rover not having a spirit. You know, we don't want to, we don't we don't appreciate thinking like that because what we what we do to our animals is we actually give them human qualities they don't have. <laughs> if you if you think about it, isn't that fun? You know, you talk to them like they're human and think they're communicating back to you. Sometimes they are communicating back to you. In my house, usually with hatred, but that's another story. Uh, you know, there there's but still at the end of the day is even that communication that they have limited understanding with you and you have limited understanding of them, is that spirit? No. Spirit's something different, and it gives us something different. Um, I'll, I'll tell you what I do when I'm teaching this at the School of Preaching. I always say the image of God uh, it implies two things God gave us that he didn't give to anything else. One, spirit, the spiritual life. Two, uh, uh, is uh, free will because God has free will and we understand that that even though we assign free will to our, our pets usually, that actually typically they're acting on instinct they're acting on, on, on whatever has, tells them what to do which is something instinctual that tells the, the goose to fly south <laughs> and then back north and the, the whale to swim on, on a, a cycle and, and, you know, different things like that. It, it, those are instincts, and it's not the same as free will, even though we can mistake it for each other. So that all goes back to how did God create this life? Well, he created it with divisions and, and separations. And when Satan brought sin into the world, it affected all of that life. Because now, now we need to sacrifice. Well, that's going to affect a lot of bulls and goats over the next uh, uh, you know, this would be upwards of, of four to eight thousand years in, in, until Christ comes, um, and, and you know, so that things are are going to to be affected because the sin comes in, and then what does Satan have himself? Oh, excuse me, <clears throat> the serpent have himself. He also has life, and now his life is going to be be punished. All the days of his life, all right? 
So uh, continuing in chapter 3, verse 17, uh, then, Adam, then to Adam he said, Because you have heeded the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree of which I commanded you, saying, You shall not eat of it. Curses is the ground for your sake, and told you shall eat of it, uh, eat of it all the days of your life. All right? So now humanity has, has a different style of work to do. Some people say this is where God gave man work to do. No, God had already given humanity work to do. Did you, did you, did you find that in chapter 2? Because humanity had to, let's see, name the animals. That's a job. Tend to the garden. That's a job. And not eat of the tree of, of knowledge of good and evil. That was apparently a job too much. So they had tasks to do in the garden. They had work to do. But now this work has changed, and there's going to be toil added to it. It's going to be more difficult. And so life changed because the situation changed. Because Free will caused Adam and Eve to make a bad decision, advised by a bad advisor, and that changed life. In verse 18, the storms and thistles, if they existed, I think it's okay, existed before, right. they were not an issue at all. Yeah, not a problem. Now they're everywhere. Yeah, yeah. If it, and that's, so you talk about, if it, did it affect plant life? Yes, because now, now we have this different style of working that's going to have to be done through thorns and thistles and, and all the other problems, you know? So, yeah, life changed. We had life originating with, with, with God, but then it changed because sin entered the world. Uh, let's see, keep reading. Verse 22, uh, Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us to know good and evil, and now lest he be, uh, put out his hand and also take of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him out of the garden of Eden to till the ground from which he was taken. Verse 24. So he drove out the man, and he placed cherubim at the east of the garden of Eden, and flaming sword which turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. So what did God do as part of the punishment or consequences of the sin? He cut off their access to one source of life, the tree of life. All right? Now, uh, okay, again, a, a non-direct question to our discussion, um, but, but worthy of asking. Um, where is the Garden of Eden? Unknown. All right, unknown. But people still look for it. You may know where it's assumed it usually is. All right, the, the Tigris and Euphrates rivers on that south side in what would be uh, uh, some territory in modern-day southeastern Iraq or Kuwait. Um, there's a better explanation on what happened to the garden. There you go. It was destroyed in the flood. It was removed from earth in the flood. That's, that's the best explanation. It's a... It's a uh, uh, it's, a, it's really a non-question of can we go find it today because probably not because it was probably destroyed in the flood and removed. Where did the tree of life go? Is, is there still a tree of life? Right. According to Revelation, the tree of life is still up in heaven as the source of life, eternal life. All right? So the, here's the thing. Life is still available. Life is still going even though life changed once sin entered the world. So I guess really the, the main two points to start our discussion on life for these next few weeks, which hopefully you'll keep coming back for, is we start with its origination in God and how it changed somewhat as we read your Bible immediately when sin entered in as a factor. And then the question is, so now what's going to happen to life from here on out from its origination and now this major change of sin? So I hope this is a good start to this class. I hope uh, you will enjoy this discussion, but also I do hope we will have more thought questions as we try to look at life from God's perspective. So um, thank you.
morning, everybody. Welcome to our morning worship hour. It's good to see everyone here this morning. Be sure and pick up a bulletin uh, so that you can have all of our announcements because I won't be going over all of them. And, uh, and then there's several on our prayer list, and we'll talk about them at the, uh, at the end of the service. I want to, uh, as, as far as uh, announcements in the bulletin, uh, there's going to be, it's not in here, but there's going to be a men's meeting next week after evening worship. So men, keep that uh, on your calendar. And of course, kids, don't forget about the pew packers after services this morning. And uh, our uh, person uh, for special prayer this uh, week, this coming week, is Nancy Barrett. So let's all keep Nancy in our prayers this week. And, uh, and I know, uh, of course, la last week was... Uh, uh, well, let's see. Uh, I'm having a brain freeze. Um, yes, and you're here today. <laughs> Laura, Price. Laura Price. Thank you. Thank you very much. Isn't that the older you get, the more the more these things happen. I used to have once in a while I'd have brain freeze, but now it's just almost every time I get up to talk, I forget something. I, I got to tell you this story, though, while I'm talking about Laura Price. I've known Laura for years. Well, there was a lady that I went to school with and knew her all my life. I mean, she was in my Bible class and her and her, her and her husband. And I was going around asking things in the class. And I looked at her, and she knew I was talking about her. But that's the class. I, and I had spoken all their names. I got to her name. And it was gone. <laughs> and, you know, it's like, it's almost like forgetting who your dad is. <laughs> I mean, it was just that close. It wasn't you, was it? No, it wasn't my wife. But, <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, uh, sorry for that. But anyway, that's a good thing that we're doing. And, uh, and it's good to know that uh, the whole congregation is praying for you that week. It just makes you feel good. And so that's a wonderful thing. And I, I appreciate us doing that. So anyway, let's uh, uh, let's keep that in mind, and also don't forget uh, there will be a meeting uh, uh, tomorrow at 6 p.m. here at the building to discuss the bridge program and the summer celebration that's going to be on August the 7th. So uh, the, all those that have been involved in that, and also anyone, all of us, try to attend that meeting uh, tomorrow at 6 p.m. And then uh, also Jack reminded me in the bulletin, there's a widows and, and widows retreat. And he's uh, checking on, there's several widows that wanna go to the retreat at Nashville on July the 29th and 30th. It says, we have some takers uh, and here are the issues that we need to iron out. Are we willing to pay for their accommodations and such thing as we did last year? And who will be who able to drive them? And, K and he says, Katie and he, and he uh, Katie and I will not be available this year. Uh, and that's so Jack is looking for someone who is able to drive uh, some widows down to that uh, retreat in Nashville. And that will be on July the 29th and 30th. So if anyone is able to, to accommodate by driving them down there, be sure and let Jack know. Uh, there's also a planning meeting, uh, a ladies' brunch for a planning meeting for the uh, March the 18th Ladies' Day. And that planning meeting is going to be uh, at 10 a.m. Saturday, August the 13th, here at the building. If you have any questions, see Joy. Uh, other announcement. Jack gave me this to read. Dear church family, we can't thank you enough for all the care you gave us while we were quarantined. We received groceries and meals, calls, messages, and prayers, and every bit of it was so encouraging and so helpful. On an unrelated note, thank you to, re thank you to replace our uh, storm door and painted our kitchen door. What a neat surprise. This congregation has always been so wonderful to us. Thank you for being our family. With love, Jack, Katie, and Andrew. 
and I'll leave these on the bulletin board in the back. Also, uh, there's, uh, we want to keep, uh, uh, well, the, the other announcements about the, the ones that are sick, I'll make at the uh, end of the service. Uh, our services this morning, uh, Mark Stewart's going to lead our singing. Gene Sanders will have our scripture reading and prayer. And uh, Todd will ha uh, lead us in communion. And so with, and of course, Jack will bring our lesson. And it's good to have Jack back in the pulpit again <laughs> after the bout that uh, him and his family has had with COVID. So it's good to have him back with us. Let's all turn our attention now to praise and worship of our God. First selection is 984, number 984. You are Lord of creation and Lord of my life, Lord of the land and the sea. You were Lord of the heavens before there was time, and Lord of all lords you will be. We bow down and we worship you, Lord. We bow down and we worship you, Lord. We bow down and we worship you, Lord. Lord of all lords, you will be. You are king of creation and king of my life. King of the land and the sea, you were born the heavens before there was time, and king of all kings you will be. We bow down and we crown you the king. We bow down and we crown you the king. We bow down. And we crown you the king, king of all kings you will be. Number 242. Number 242. After the singing of this hymn, we'll have our scripture reading and our word of prayer. We read of a place that's called heaven. It's made for the pure and the free. These truths in God's word he has given. How beautiful heaven must be. How beautiful heaven must be. Sweet home of the happy and free. Fair haven of rest for the weary. How beautiful heaven must be. In heaven no drooping nor pining, no wishing for elsewhere to be. God's light is forever there shining. How beautiful heaven must be, how beautiful heaven must be, sweet home of the happy and free, fair haven of rest for the weary, how beautiful heaven must be. Your waters of life there are flowing, and all who will drink may be free. Rare jewels of splendor are glowing. How beautiful heaven must be! How beautiful heaven must be! Sweet home of the happy and free, fair haven of rest for the weary. How beautiful heaven must be.
The scripture reading today, I'll be reading out of the New King James Version. It will be Ephesians 5, 8 through 17. Ephesians 5, 8 through 17. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. Find, finding out what is acceptable to the Lord. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of those things which are done by them in secret. But all things that are exposed are made manifest by the light. For whatever makes manifest is light. Therefore, he says, awake you who sleep, arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Therefore do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. If you would, would you please bow? Father, we pray for Nancy at this time, Father, and we ask you, Lord, that you will give her a good week and bless her, Father. Dear Lord, we thank you for George that's with us today, Father, our visitor, and all other visitors, Father, that we have here today. We ask that you bless them and return them, Father. Dear Lord, as we go into prayer now, we thank you, Father, that for showing us the light in you and doing what is pleasing to you. We know when we fall that you will be our light, Father, and you'll be there with a strong arm to pick us up and help us, Father. Help us to be humble and thankful, Father, for what that we have and what you have given us. Father, we thank you for the gift of your love and, and the grace of your salvation. And Father, we ask that you bless this congregation, Father. Dear Lord, we all need prayer, Father, and we pray that you'll be with each and every one of us. Help us, Father, to have a forgiving spirit and help us, Father, to have a forgiving spirit. Dear God, we pray for the sick and the shut-ins that we have here. Father, we ask that you comfort them and bless them. And Father, as we, we pray for our young children too, Father, in this church congregation, Father. We pray that, that they will learn and as they grow, Father, they will get stronger in your word. And Father, we ask that you bless the teachers that work with them. And dear God, it's it's good to see Jack back, Father, and to have him have a lesson today. And Father, what he will be bringing, I know, will be spirit and truth, in spirit and truth, Father. And dear Lord, we ask you that you would continue to bless all of us. And Father, we ask you to protect us. And it's in Jesus' name that I pray, amen. Before we partake of the Lord's Supper, to help us prepare our minds, if you would please turn with me to number 330, number 330. On this Lord's Day we assemble round the table of the Lord. Happy hearts are made to tremble when we hear his blessed word. Thanks to God for such a Savior, now enthroned in heaven above. Thanks for his exalted favor. Bless me, moral of his love. We recall his broken body as we look upon this bread. Give ye thanks, divide and eat it in my memory, he said. Thanks to God for such a Savior, now enthroned in heaven above. Thanks for this ex 
exalted favor, bless me more of his love, and this crimson cup reminds us of that dread scene long ago when he died in pain and anguish there his blood was made to flow thanks to god for such a savior now enthroned in heaven above thanks for this exalted favor bless me for all of his love there in agony he suffered on the cross for you and me now upon the throne he's reigning blessed lamb of calvary thanks to god for such a savior now enthroned in heaven above thanks for this exalted favor bless me memorial of his love as always on the first day of the week as commanded we partake of the lord's supper and as always, we go back to the Bible for the authorization to do everything as well as the pattern to which to follow. If you would open your Bible to Luke, the 22nd chapter, uh, beginning in verse 14, that's Luke, the 22nd chapter, beginning in verse, verse 14. And when the hour came, he reclined at the table and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you that from now on I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body which is given for, me, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise the cup, after they had eaten, saying, this cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. Let us pray for the unleavened bread. Holy Father, we give thanks at this time. The ability to worship you without duress. Father, to, to learn things about your word. To be in fellowship with your brethren. Father, we're very thankful that you chose to die on our behalf. You chose to, to live a sinless life, to be the perfect sacrifice for us. Father, we can, never, we can never say thank you enough for such a wondrous gift. We partake this unleavened bread to remind us to keep it constantly in front of us of what you consistently in and constantly have done for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Let us pray for the unleavened, for the fruit of the vine. Holy Father, once again, we read of the account of your suffering. We read of the things that were done to you on our behalf. And Father, it, it, it pains us. And yet, we're so very grateful that you chose to do this, that you chose to sacrifice yourself for us, to endure 
pain and humiliation and all of the sorrows of this world for us. Father, as we partake of this fruit of the vine to, rem to remind us of these things, be with us. Forgive us of our sins. In Jesus' name, amen. Lord's Supper is concluded. We take uh, at this time the, <clears throat> the opportunity to lay by and store so that uh, the church may continue. Let us pray. Holy Father, for the blessings that you've given us, we are simply stewards. Whatever we, we do in this world, we're simply the stewards of the things that you've given us. And as stewards, we give back to the owner, back to you, the things that, uh, as we've been prospered, so that the work here can continue, so that the missionaries that we support can continue to, to spread your word, so that those that are less fortunate may be comforted. Father, in all, we're very thankful for the blessings that you give us and encourage us to, to have the, the generous spirit uh, as you've commanded. Forgive us of our sins. In Jesus' name, amen. Song of Encouragement to Come to Christ after Brother Jack's lesson will be number 179. 179. If you would please mark that at this time. After having marked that, if you would please turn with me to number 220. Number 220. If it's convenient to do so, if you like, please stand. I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. I know that he is living, whatever men may say. I see his hand of mercy, I hear his voice of cheer. At just the time I need him, he's always near. He lives, he lives. Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives. He within my heart. In all the world around me, I see his loving care. And though my heart grows weary, I never will despair. I know that he is leading through all the stormy blast, the day of his appearing will come at last. He lives, he lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. Rejoice, rejoice. So Christian, lift up your voice and sing. 
Eternal hallelujahs to Jesus Christ the King, the hope of all who seek Him, the help of all who find. None other is so loving, so good and kind. He lives, he lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along my narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. Good morning again. It is good to be back with you. We went to one week of camp instead of two. Uh, we had at least 15 cases of COVID amongst the staff. Uh, that has now spread to campers and is uh, they're still dealing with it and uh, we had other issues during the week we had a, a, a failure of water in a couple of the buildings which means we could only meet in certain or use the water from certain buildings I mean it was it was a great week at camp uh, and it really was that's uh, not supposed to be sarcastic as it might sound it's it, it's it's amazing how when you get a group of Christians together and we're all trying to push the same direction, and you have a, a good group of kids. It's, it's, it's a great, uh, we had a great week of camp despite all the problems. Uh, the good news, uh, between the two weeks of camp, the one we were at and the one we were supposed to work, there was uh, four baptisms. Uh, you have four new brothers and sisters in Christ, uh, and uh, uh, we, we, we taught uh, lessons and, and, and tried to encourage these kids between the two weeks. The, the week we went to, uh, our theme was studying the book of Hebrews, uh, which is, is not a shallow subject at all. We were studying Hebrews in, in the mindset of looking at, at hermeneutics. And, and that, the thing is, is this lesson I, I have this morning comes from one of my lessons from that week that I presented uh, because, you know, as, as Seth brought up last week when he filled in for me, you know, we, we got to determine how the Bible tells us what to do. We got to determine uh, uh, what what in Scripture is for us to do. There, there's no Scripture that says, "Jack, go do this." So the question becomes, how do I figure out what I'm supposed to do? And that's what hermeneutics, the study of interpretation, does. And, and, and focusing our study on Hebrews allowed us to to look at at one book of the Bible and and and, and kind of break down the model it sets for how we can interpret the Bible and know what it's saying to us. So uh, one of my topics assigned to me to uh, uh, speak about that week was the topic of silence. I'm going to count the giggling. Y'all almost made it longer than the boys Wednesday morning did when I taught this lesson. It's interesting when we talk about the, the terminology of silence in general, we're, we're in a very loud world. We're, we're in a, a world that, that between all the devices we have and the screens, it's hard to get silence. It, it, was, it was interesting earlier in the week at camp, uh, uh, we we're at a time where we we're supposed to lower the flag, but it rained, so we already pulled the flag in, and, and we're sitting there, and, and we're not quite ready for dinner yet, and we're not quite, and I, and I just, I asked the kids, sit in silence and just reflect, or, or as, as it says in the Psalms, you know, be still and know that I am God. There's times to just be in silence in this world that is so loud and so that may be where your mind first goes when we talk about silence, but there's, there's other things we learn from silence, especially in Scripture. And that study actually starts back in Joshua chapter 6. 
In Joshua chapter 6, we, we see a lesson based on silence. It says in Joshua chapter 6, verses uh, uh, 3 through 5, that God commanded, You shall march around the city, all you men of war. You shall go all around the city once. This you shall do six days. And seven priests shall bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark. But the seventh day you shall march around the city seven times, and the priest shall blow the trumpet. It shall come to pass when they make a long blast with the ram's horn, and when you hear the sound of the trumpet, that all the people shall shout with a great shout, then the wall of the city will fall down flat, and the people shall go up every man straight before him. So this is from the, the narrative that tells us how Jericho was conquered by Joshua and the armies of Israel. And Joshua is given the command that you line everybody up a certain way. You line all the men of war up, 600,000 men. You line them up. You march to the city. You go around it once, and you come back. You do that for six days. And then the last day, you march there to the city. You go around it seven times. And then blow a blast on the ram's horns. And then give a mighty shout. And the walls are going to fall. And you're going to be able to take the city. Now here's what's interesting. We could study the, the miracle. We could study how it happens supernaturally. We can study uh, uh, the obedience. We can study from Jericho's perspective. Of what was going on. But that's not what I want to focus on this morning. What I want to focus on is something found. In Joshua 6 verse 10. Where it says. Now Joshua had commanded the people, saying, You shall not shout or make any noise with your voice, nor shall a word proceed out of your mouth until the day I say to you, Shout, then you shall shout. You notice what Joshua just did here? When you go back to God's commands, found in verses 3 through 5, God never tells Joshua to tell the people not to shout on day 1 through 6. He never tells them that. What Joshua did is he inferred from silence based on a command that was given directly to him that because we shout on day seven, we don't shout on day one through six. And he commanded the people and said, this is what we must do. What Joshua did here is he made an argument from silence. He made an argument from what God did not say. And the people obeyed, and the walls fell, and they conquered Jericho. See, just at the outset of this, all I want to establish is that we can know something from silence as Joshua was able to determine. And the truth is, is today when we talk about silence in Scripture and how it binds on us today, it's complicated because because the, the classic example was always if, uh, if, if mom sent you to the, 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 the kid to the store and said, buy milk, bread, and eggs. If the kid comes back with milk, bread, and eggs, and candy, they're going to get in trouble. Well, guess what? We, we live in a very blessed nation in a very blessed time. And so if, if, if we send Andrew to the store and he's supposed to buy milk, bread, and eggs, and, and, and he comes back with candy, and because he's, he, he's a smart kid, he's going to bring back candy for him and us. He's not a dummy. We're going to go, hey, thanks, bud. We're not going to go, you disobeyed us. Even though he made a possibly incorrect inference from silence, we're still not going to get on to him. In fact, we live in a society where more is better. The coach go tells the team, hey, over the summer, so you're prepared for the fall season, you got to run. you got to run a mile every day. If a kid comes back and says, hey, coach, I ran two miles every day, the coach is going to go, well, you're off the team then because you did something I didn't tell you to do. No, the coach is going to say, great job. The coach is going to say, you went the extra mile, literally, and we're going to praise you for that. So the argument from silence kind of is difficult today to illustrate. In fact, it doesn't necessarily apply to every aspect of life, and I don't want to try to apply it to every aspect of life, but I want to find out what the Bible says about it. And when it comes to the Bible, the silence does tell us some things. Even though it doesn't apply to all parts of our culture, it does apply to what God tells us to do. And so in the Bible, we must learn to listen to the silence of the scriptures. And the next place we want to look at that is found in Hebrews. In this case, we're going to start in Hebrews chapter 4. When you read through the first, especially half of Hebrews, a character emerges that would be surprising to, to you know, people who are just straight reading through the Bible the first time. 
It's a character that was introduced briefly in Genesis. He's brought up one more time in Psalms, but then he disappears from Scripture until Hebrews. And suddenly in Hebrews, we find out this character is a major personality in the Bible that we need to know more about. And his name was Melchizedek. Now, first of all, it says in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14, Seeing that then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Christ today is our high priest. He once and for all made the sacrifice to save us from our sins. He's the, the mediator of the covenant that brings us closer to God. And so the Hebrew writer is trying to make the point that, look, Hebrew people, you were dependent on a priesthood that was inferior. It wasn't as good as the priesthood you can now have in Christ. Now that you're Christians, you have a new priesthood, a priesthood in Christ. But there's a problem with that priesthood because all the priests under the law of Moses had to come from the tribe of Levi. And when we studied the genealogical record recorded in the Bible, Christ is not from the tribe of Levi. He is from the tribe of Judah. He's a descendant of David. He's not Levitical at all so how can he be a high priest when we go over to hebrews chapter 7 the hebrew writer tries to explain this and the first verse we want to read is verse 14 of hebrews chapter 7 i, I guess your, your homework for the afternoon is read the whole chapter we don't we're not going to do it in today's lesson but we're going to look at verse 14 and some other verses where it says for it is evident that our lord arose from judah of which tribe moses spoke nothing concerning the priesthood. See, God only said the Levites could be priests through Moses. God never said, thou shalt not have a priest from Judah, Reuben, Simeon, Benjamin, Joseph, Manasseh, Asher. When he said the priest had to come from Levi, by silence, he eliminated all other options. Judah's not from Levi. Therefore, Judah could not provide a priest. So even though he didn't specifically say it, silence, according to Hebrews, gives us the answer. But wait, Christ is our high priest. How can that be if, if he's perfect and, 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 and you know, did all those things for us and became the perfect sacrifice for us? How can that be if, if he's not from the tribe of Levi? Well, the Hebrew writer explains. Going back to verse 11 of Hebrews 7. Therefore, if perfection were through the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need was there for another priest should rise according to the order of Melchizedek and not be called according to the order of Aaron? Why can Christ be our priest even though he's not from the tribe of Levi? Because there's another order of priest. The order of Melchizedek. See, back in Genesis... When, when Abram had gone off to save Lot from captivity that he was taken in this, this strange battle of nine city-states of, of the ancient world of Mesopotamia and the Jordan River Valley, when all that happens, Abram goes and saves Lot, brings back the captives, brings back the goods, and he meets this priest in the city of Salem, which eventually would be Jerusalem. He's a priest, he's a king, he's also a prophet. He meets this priest that was not Hebrew, was not Jewish, couldn't have been. There weren't any of those yet. And he gives him a tithe offering. And Melchizedek blesses him for that. See, this priest Melchizedek that appears out of nowhere in Genesis as if he had no beginning or no end, we don't know his parents' names, we don't know if he had any, any successors to his position, all we know is he exists. And Abram made an offering, making him a greater priest than the Levites. Because the Levites were still a few generations away from existence. Therefore, the Levites, according to the Hebrew writer, in Abram's body, were subservient to Melchizedek. 
So it explains in verse 14 of Hebrews chapter 7, For it is evident that our Lord arose from Judah, of which Moses spoke nothing concerning the priesthood, yet can be a priest, according to verse 15. And it is yet far more evident if in the likeness of Melchizedek there arises another priest. So when you go back to verses 4 through 6, it says, Now consider how great this man was to whom even the patriarch Abram gave a tenth of the spoil, and indeed those who are of the, the sons of Levi who received the priesthood have a commandment to receive tithes from the people according to the law that is from their brethren, though they have come from the loins of Abraham, but he whose genealogy is not derived from them received tithes from Abraham and blessed him who had the promises. This argument from silence that the Hebrew writer is developing that the Melchizedek priesthood is greater than the Levitical priesthood is actually making an argument on how God superseded the law of Moses and the Levitical priesthood with this priesthood revealed in Hebrews, with this priesthood through Christ and Melchizedek. Therefore, verse 17, for if he testifies you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek, go down to verse 20, and inasmuch as he was not made priest without an oath, for if they become priests without an oath, but he with an oath by him who said to him, the Lord has sworn and will not relent, you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. Okay, so first of all, let me say, this is a lot for Sunday morning. <laughs> and we're going through a lot of difficult scriptures. I'm not apologizing. I'm just saying I understand if, if you're getting a little lost, because I am. However, what we see is, is not necessarily just the argument about why Christ is our priest now according to the order of Melchizedek, though that's important. What we're seeing is how God is interpreting the events through the Hebrew writer for them to follow. How God is interpreting this character of Melchizedek revealed twice before in Scripture, Genesis and Psalms. And now using that example to say, and so here's where Christ comes from. He's revealing to us that, that the central character of the Bible is Christ. The central point of the Bible is to reveal Christ to us and who he is and how he's better than anything that had come before him and greater than anything that could ever come to give us our salvation as our great high priest. But yet some of the mystery of that gospel, see Ephesians, included in that is, but how? And all of these answers we may not fully understand in the here and now. We can't plumb the depths of them because they're so great. But we can still determine some things from what the Bible tells us. And yes, that includes commands and examples and implications but also includes what god didn't tell us because there's a lot of things in the bible not covered but from silence we can infer whether we should or should not do them so let's complete this discussion here real quick with a few more verses from hebrews 7 about christ starting in verse 22 where it says by so much more jesus has become a surety of a better covenant verse 24 but he because he continues forever has an unchangeable priesthood see the point to the hebrews is this christ is better the covenant through christ is better than the covenant through moses the priesthood of christ is better than the priesthood of levi everything you have in christianity is better so the message of the hebrews is don't leave that by getting confused on how to interpret the more difficult parts of scriptures. Don't leave that and turn back to something that isn't as good. The question becomes, in the church, almost 2,000 years after Hebrews is written, now how do we use this principle of silence that tells us about the priesthood of of, of, of the Melchizedek that tells us about the, the walls falling down and when they were supposed to shout. How does that principle of silence apply to us today? That's the question. And one of the first places this comes up is so often with, with music. But I'm not going to 
dwell on that. I'm going to mention it, but I'm not going to dwell on that. I just want to get this, this point across that, that when we're trying to apply the argument of silence today, it only applies in that it eliminates options that would change what God clearly told us to do. Okay, let's go really zoom out to something very simple. The Bible says, thou shalt, or the, let me start over. The Bible does not say, thou shalt not do heroin. So how do we know that we're not supposed to inject heroin into our bodies? Well, we're supposed to treat our bodies like a temple of God. We're supposed to take care of, of our bodies and not put harmful things in them. And heroin is very harmful. Therefore, we can conclude that even though the Bible does not say, thou shalt not do this, we ought not do this. Because it would defy a clear command of the Bible, and that's the point. Silence by itself, as you learn at the beginning of the lesson, tells us nothing. Silence by our, itself is just silence. But when you apply silence to the commands, examples, and implications of the Bible, then it starts telling us something. We sing because we have a command to do that in Ephesians 5.19 and Colossians 3.16. So we have a command to do something. We do not use mechanical instruments because of silence, because of how those can and often do supersede the singing that's commanded to be done through our voices by implication and our hearts. This can be applied to other acts too, especially in worship. Why do we take unleavened bread and fruit of the vine? The Bible says, never says, thou shalt not take hamburgers and french fries at the Lord's Supper. But yet we know that that would be inappropriate because the thing that was initially set out for us to take by Christ himself was unleavened bread and fruit of the vine. And so by the implication of silence, everything else is eliminated. And the thing is, is, is I, I even think without John 4, 24, God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. Without that verse, this, this may not actually apply. Without that verse to tell us that, that worship does have to be done in a certain way. Worship does have a correct way to do it and a wrong way to do it. The, the Bible implies that elsewhere. Look in uh, uh, Mark chapter 7, verse 7, where it says, And in vain they worshiped me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. See, there's a vain way to worship. There's an incorrect way to worship. Therefore, if there's an incorrect way to worship, we have to find the correct way to worship. If Nadab and Abihu are killed for offering strange fire, for doing something wrong in worship, God must take this seriously. And now we have to determine, how does God want us to worship him? Well, in spirit and in truth. Those examples in command establish that now we must Determine what can be done through command, example, implication, and silence. This doesn't just apply to worship, though. It applies to salvation itself. How are you to be saved? Because the Bible doesn't say, Jack, if thou wants to be saved, thou must climb the highest mountain. Thou, Jack, if thou wants to be saved, thou must say this prayer. The Bible doesn't say that. The Bible doesn't even say, Jack, if thou wantest to be saved, thou must repent and be baptized. It doesn't say that. But what we have is examples made to other people, commands made to other people that say these things, and we can determine if they did it and it was correct, then we can do it and also be correct if it applies to us. See, the good news is, i got some good news for you. We don't have to go to Jericho and walk around it because that was a command given to somebody else that is not an example for us. And we have to keep studying and interpreting to figure out what the Bible tells us to do and what the Bible tells us not to do. If the Bible contained every thou shalt not that we needed as humanity, it would exhaust every page of paper we could have in existence. Because guess what? Humanity is pretty creative on inventing sin. 
And so what God does instead is in so many cases, he says, do this, and by silence, it eliminates the other options. And like I said, that applies to our salvation as much as anything else, because what we're doing is, is silence is the baby we're laying in the crib of command, example, and implication. Silence rests on that, because silence itself tells us nothing. Now, like worship is important, according to John 4, 24 and other verses, salvation is important, according to Romans chapter 6, verse 23, which says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. See, salvation is important. Our eternal life is important. And so, therefore, we must ask then, well, then what do I need to do to have this salvation? How can I know I'm saved? Well, we say by following the Bible. The Bible says, Hebrews eleven six. 6, without faith it is impossible to please him. Well, you can't please God without faith, therefore you must have faith. That's a good deduction. It's not directly what's said, but we can deduce that from without faith it is impossible to please him. And, and what about repentance? Christ came to teach repentance, Luke 13, 3. So therefore, it must be important if Christ came to teach it, if Christ came to tell us to do the repentance, and let me throw this out while we're here. People who say, oh, well, you can take no action to receive your salvation. Well, do, do you have to repent? Repentance is a big action, guys. It's an action to avoid sin and avoid tem the temptations that led us into that sin. It's an action to, to stay away from, from doing what was in our past. And there is, is not an honest person who claims to be following Christ out there who would tell you, oh, you don't have to change your life. The very word is conversion, which means change. And repentance is a big action that's part of that. Christ came to teach repentance, Luke 13, 3, and therefore we must learn repentance and practice repentance. But there again, that in of itself is just one part. We must have faith, we must have repentance. It's not faith alone, it's not repentance alone. It's faith and repentance, and we keep adding Confession. Christ says, those who confess me before man, I will confess before my Father who is in heaven. It, it, it's an example of, of not confessing of, of sins and saying I've done wrong. That's part of repentance. <laughs> it's a confession saying I admit Christ is my Savior. I admit it's Christ and I need to follow. And, and again, there's not a scripture that says, you know, Todd, you ought to do this. <laughs> Randy, you ought to do this. You ought, to, you ought to confess. But what we see is Christ saying confession is important. Therefore, we can infer from that that we must do it. See how this keeps working? See how this keeps building on our interpretation? I promise we're going somewhere and we're going to circle back around the silence. So faith, repentance, confession, baptism. The big sticky wicket. The big action you're not allowed to take to receive salvation, except 1 Peter 3.21 says that baptism doth now save us. So does it save us or not? Well, it's for the remission of sins, Acts 2.38. So it's saving us from sin. It does save us, 1 Peter 3.21. And so it's right there in Scripture that this act, by the way, which is much more passive than repentance, Baptism is done to you. You have to repent. Digress. So it's an action that must be done to be born of water and spirit, John 3, 3 through 5, and must be taught to the world, Matthew 28, 19, and we can determine from that it must be important, and then we determine from the Bible what it does, and therefore we do it, and we just leave it there, right? No, because we have to keep using interpretation, hermeneutics, command, example, inference, silence, uh, 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 even expediencies to determine how we're supposed to follow God. And Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. John 14, 15. And by the way, Jesus commands all the things we've already talked about and more. More to follow him, like worshiping him in spirit and truth. More to follow him, like telling others, telling the world about salvation. More to follow him, like serving those who are in need, according to the example of the Samaritan revealed in, in Luke. And so many other things we have to do that never says, you go do that. 
It says this was done or this should be done, and we infer. Now, here's the thing. That circles back around to silence. Building off the New Testament, this argument that our, our, our faith needs to lead to repentance and confession before we are baptized for the remission of sins eliminates other options of salvation that are not mentioned in Scripture. Scripture never gives an example or a command that a prayer will save you. Oh, Paul prayed before he was saved. Yeah, he was struck blind, but he wasn't saved until he was baptized. Oh, it says, call on the name of the Lord. But according to Paul, who wrote calling on the name of the Lord in Romans 10, in Acts 22, he said calling on the name of the Lord is being baptized, Acts twenty two sixteen. 16. There's no command that implies a prayer will save you. The only time faith only is mentioned in Scripture is to say you are not saved by faith alone, James 2, I believe, verse 24. So when we're told, here's what you need to do, by silence it eliminates our other options. Therefore, we have to do what God has told us to do. Now, is this complicated? Yes. Will this lead to actually some discussions of, of well, okay, what, what, what does silence mean in this case? Because we looked at an example that silence forbid speaking in Joshua 6, but silence allowed a priest according to the order of Melchizedek in Hebrews 7. So we got some discussions to have to determine what we can do best to serve God. But once we see a clear line through command, example, implication, and even expediency of what we're supposed to do, Silence eliminates, in many cases, the other options. Is that hard to understand? In a great, blessed society like ours today, where going the extra mile is important. Yes. But does that change that that's what Scripture teaches? No. So here's where we leave it this morning. If you don't understand what we talked about this morning... Let us know. We'd love to talk to you further about it. I love discussing the Bible with Christian brothers and sisters and members of the community. It's kind of what I do. But if you do understand some of what we're saying and you need to make a change in your life based on the commands of the Bible, the examples of the Bible, the implications of the Bible, the silence of the Bible, then make that change now. Make that change that you need to make and as always, if we can help you do that in any way, let us know. If we can help you do it right now, please come forward while we stand and sing the invitation song. So far from his presence come today, hear his loving voice calling still. Now. 
Let us go to God in prayer as we're dismissed. Our Holy Father, we're so thankful for this beautiful Lord's Day. We're thankful, Father, for the time that we've been able to assemble here and to worship you and to praise you and honor you as, as our God. To thank you for our Savior, Jesus, to be built, built up spiritually, to be rejuvenated, and to share with the love that we have for you with one another. Help us as we leave this place to go out and to may our lives be lights in this world that people can see Jesus living within us. Heavenly Father, we have many of our congregation that are sick and are suffering from physical ailments. We ask you to watch over them, help them to find the, the, uh, the remedies that they need to get them well again. And Father, we just pray for those remedies and we pray for the doctors and nurses working on the people that are, uh, that are ill. And we pray that you'll return them to their health. We have many that are old, older and uh, shut in and we ask you to comfort them and help us to be an encouragement to them. Go with us now, Father, as we separate and bring us back tonight as we come together again. It's in Jesus' name I pray, amen. <laughs>